Welcome to The Third Story. I'm your host, Leo Sidrin, joined today by my special guest host, Ben Sidrin. Ben Sidrin, welcome to The Third Story. It is an honor and a pleasure to be a guest host on The Third Story, being a great fan of The Third Story and also a fan of your several guest hosts. I'm happy to have you here today, Ben, because uh, today's episode features saxophonist and searcher Jacques Schwartz Bart. Uh, I know I've told you a little bit about him this week as I'm putting the episode together. And the reason I think it's an interesting time to talk about him in our little sequence of uh, interviews is because I'm just coming off of a series of these four conversations that started at the end of last year with saxophonist Rick Margitza. We were playing with him in Paris together, followed by three piano players, Fred Hirsch, Kenny Werner, and most recently, Aaron Parks. These are four examples of jazz musicians who, in many ways, it was like a foregone conclusion that they were going to become jazz musicians. You know, you started with Rick Margitza, who at 26 years old was playing with Miles Davis. Fred Hirsch, at the same age, was playing at the Vanguard with Joe Henderson. Kenny Werner's narrative is very tied up in the idea that he was a prodigy and ultimately the experience of being talented and musical so young led him to develop the ideas that became effortless mastery. And then finally, we landed at pianist Aaron Parks, who at 14 years old skipped high school, went straight to college, and was playing with Terrence Blanchard at 18 years old. These are people for whom becoming a jazz musician was a very natural thing to do. And it seemed that they were able to take the music out of the air, that they that they heard it and understood it like a language even before they were old enough to know what that meant. And you and I had this really interesting conversation, Ben, a few years ago after we went through the Newport Jazz Festival and we heard Joey Alexander. And at the time, it was this thinking that maybe there are some people who are just more tuned into it and that there are these kind of uh, unusual special cases. Savants. Savants. Uh, people who hear this language, really, and, and they're able to speak it early on immediately. And subsequently, I've done a lot of thinking about this. It makes me wonder if there are certain things that are happening, even just in the harmony and the melody of the music, that refer to, pull from stuff in nature. You know, naturally occurring beautiful things. That the reason we think it's beautiful is because it actually is beautiful. I mean, in a kind of platonic, a natural, universal way. See, now this uh, podcast of yours has led you down the deepest rabbit hole of all. And it starts out and it pretends to be about jazz, but really what it's about is the nature of the human animal, questions of platonic beauty, and how we understand or know anything at all, which I think is fascinating because it starts out as jazz. It starts out on the very top level, on the surface, as being about a business or a pedagogy or an experience that you fall upon when you're a young person. But it leads you, as I suppose all things do, to the deeper and deeper levels. The thing is, that it's clear that the jazz experience goes deeper and goes faster and more assuredly to these deep questions. And it doesn't matter who you talk to about it, whether it's an old bebopper, whether it's a young kid just out of Berkeley, they're all wrestling with the, with these questions, which I think is uh, so profound. It's, it's like the music has a gravity and a weight of its own. And as we say, it has a grammar that's similar to language, which is so enticing because it makes one think almost immediately that it's a way of knowing without understanding or perhaps understanding without knowing. That leads me beautifully to today's conversation with Jacques Schwartzbart. Jacques Schwartzbart is a guy who had a different relationship with music. Rather than being the savant, the prodigy when it came to music, he was somebody who was very much in touch with his own personal narrative early on, which is something, for example, that Kenny Werner had to come to through the back door. He had the music together, and then he had to figure, well, what does this mean about him as a person, and what does this mean about living a life, and all of that. Here comes Jacques Schwartz-Bart. His mother 
was a writer from Guadeloupe. His father was a French Jewish intellectual writer as well, and he grew up in Guadeloupe in Switzerland. Uh, his family lived in Africa. This is somebody who had been around the world as a young man, experiencing and soaking up different, not only different cultures outside of himself, but getting in touch with the different aspects of who he was. He was a a black Caribbean Jew with French ties, and I'm referring to him as the world's first voodoo. We've heard a lot about Jew boos. Those are Jewish Buddhists. Uh, That's a relatively common pairing lately. He's a voodoo. His mother was very interested in Haitian voodoo. His father was a Jew. He's uh, living kind of in between those two worlds still today. I think he might be the first voodoo. In fact, he was a, an exceptional student. He excelled. He was pushed ahead. By 24 years old, he was a graduate of Sciences Po, which is the prestigious French uh, political science college, and he was working in the French Senate. As he describes it, he had a driver, and he had a staff, and he had privilege, and he had money, and he was positioned to uh, have a very prestigious career in the French government when, and some of you can probably relate to this, he was at a friend's house, and he happened to put a saxophone in his mouth. (laughs) And lo and behold, out came music. And now what is that? How do we even discuss this? When some people take years to get a sound on a horn, and the truth is other people can literally take a saxophone, never having put a reed on a mouthpiece, put it together and play a melody. How is that even possible? This is uh, what we call epigenetics at this point. This is information that's passed down at the level of genes, at the molecular level, which we really don't understand a lot about. But, but, But here's an example. This is why I like you to come along with me on this ride every now and then, Ben, because the epigenetics, see, this is, I see where you went there, epigenetics. Well, the other thing I want to say is it's very interesting that you brought up the Kenny Warner thing, because I think there's a real connection uh, between Schwartzbart and the, the kind of conversation you had with Kenny Warner that, uh, let me summarize it in a different way, which is I would say, Kenny Warner would say, listen, if you can swing playing one note and that's your true note, then that's as good as you ever have to swing. You don't have to master everything. You have to master your, You have to be yourself. And this idea that you can pick up a horn and be yourself doesn't necessarily mean that you're more of yourself than somebody is of their selves. It means that there is a channel, that there's a channel that can be opened in all of us and that it, what we call jazz is a very powerful and direct way to clear that channel if one dares go there. Jacques Schwartzbart dared to go there when he put the saxophone in his mouth and, as he describes it, had an instant connection with the instrument. So much so that he was playing his first gig the next night. The next night he played his first gig, and then he worked uh, that summer, apparently, on and off. And uh, by the time he got through that season, he was a saxophone player. There was really only one inevitable outcome of this experience, which is that he took time to deal with this and confront it, what it meant. And what it meant to him is he had to leave his career in the French government and at uh, the age of 27 years old, moved to Boston and enroll in the Berklee College of Music. So he was an unusual cat. I mean, here he was a guy with a totally different background and a real understanding of where he came from. Now he's going to learn how to play a solo. See, what I think is so interesting about this is a cat understood personal narrative deeply before he started to explore the technical aspect of playing the horn. And in his case, that unique approach was recognized immediately by some of his teachers and mentors. And as a student still at Berkeley, he was working regularly with Bob Moses, with Danilo Perez, with Giovanni Hidalgo. These are three mentors that he speaks about who influenced his development and showed him the way to take his personal musical and social identity and put it into the music to create his own style. So he's been playing with these ingredients since he really started. And uh, what does that mean? Well, he developed this thing called guoca jazz, which is the combining of Guadalupean guoca music, guoca drumming and guoca music, and jazz. He's also developed Haitian voodoo jazz because his mother was uh, active in the Haitian voodoo community, and so he knew these voodoo chants. And now, most recently, he started to explore his Jewish roots and bring Jewish chants and Jewish music 
into his world of jazz. Of course, you and I relate to this personally because you have also been uh, swimming in that same pool. Well, and it's like we, we, we have said in the past, you can play an instrument eight hours a day for 20 years, and in the end, the instrument hasn't changed, but you have been entirely transformed. And I think that's one of the attractive aspects of this music. It is self-transformative. If you approach it with the kind of, I almost want to say humility, you know, the, the sense that you want to discover some truth in there, it will reveal it to you, but you have to be prepared for what it reveals because it will take you down a road where there are no drivers and you don't have a staff, but you will learn something. In addition to all of that uh, personal musical exploration with the Gwoka jazz and the Haitian voodoo jazz and the Jewish jazz, Jacques Schwartz-Bart was also an early member of the neo-soul community, played with D'Angelo and Erica Badu and uh, Roy Hargrove. He was a member of Roy Hargrove's band for a long time and eventually became a founding uh, player in Roy's RH Factor, which was a very exciting project that brought together jazz and hip-hop. So although it wasn't really where he came from, Jacques Schwartz-Bart also landed in the midst of this scene that has continued to influence young musicians today. He describes it as being part of a rhythmic revolution. I think we've said enough here, and it's time to get into it. Jacques Schwartz-Bart and me on a cold January afternoon, the day after he performed at the Winter Jazz Festival earlier this year. It was a treat to meet him on the street. And let me tell you this. Uh, we've been talking about some other episodes. I don't want to leave you out in the cold if you don't know where to get them. There's a simple uh, thing to do, place to go. It's third-story.com. That's where you go back and hear all the episodes, including the ones with Kenny Werner, Aaron Parks, Fred Hirsch, and Rick Margitza that we spoke of earlier. Also, now that you're inspired, and Ben, thank you for providing those inspirational words today, you may have done the heavy lifting today in getting people inspired to participate on a deeper level, and you know what they do, then they go to Patreon. They go to patreon.com and third-story.com are all put together. I'm not sure how. Yeah, that's, a, that's a con. They're combined in the great speeds. They fuse. They fuse. <laughs> <at the great. laughs> patreon.com slash third story podcast is the way to go and get involved on a deeper level. I think you know what I'm talking about. You can get that link also from the website. On the website, one of the other things that you can do is listen to a curated Spotify playlist of Jacques Schwartz Bart's music. I know you like getting into those. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that ever since you've done these playlists, it has really helped open up the conversations to me when you hear not only what these people sound like, what these musicians sound like, but what their influences were. And you hear that, a, a great addition, I must say. Thank you. So there's videos and Spotify playlists for you to get into. And that's it. Without further ado, my conversation with the great Jacques Schwartz Bart, often known as Brother Jacques. Brother Jacques? What, what is that, Brother Jacques? That's his name. That's what he goes by. His website is brotherjacques.com. Like Brother Jack McDuff, he's Brother Jacques. Oh, this music has really done him in. That's all I can say. I don't know the cat, but I can tell what's happening already. Brother Jacques, here we go. Brother Jacques. Mr. Leo Cidran. <laughs> Man, there are so many kinds of conversations that we can have a, around your career because you've been so multifaceted. Your, your career does not follow, and your life does not follow a straight line. Absolutely. Uh, sometimes describe myself as being bored between two tectonic plates mm -hmm. and learning to be comfortable in that crevice. Yes. Withstanding tremendous pressure from all sides and still seeing how I can build bridges connect differences, cultures, uh, and now also generations as well. When you say you feel tremendous pressure on both sides, is that to say that you feel pressure to choose a side? It's one of the many pressures. The first and the most uh, difficult pressure was uh, the history of uh, both sides, the Jewish history and, and the, the black history. Feel the pain from all sides. Mm. You know, my father basically carrying on his own shoulders, the tragedy of seeing his entire people disappear. Because let, let, let's face it, although there are Jewish communities everywhere, they are very different. And so his people, the Eastern Jewish population, with the culture the, of the, the shtetl, the Yiddish uh, tradition of, of uh, 
theater, uh, literature, humor, philosophy. All this pretty much vanished in a few years. Mm -hmm. It's something that uh, never left him. He was really rarely talking about it because it was, it was just too heavy. Was he born in France? Yes, he was born in France, uh, uh, and his family came from uh, Poland. Uh -huh. They arrived in France the year that he was born. Uh -huh. And they were fleeing? They were running? They, they were running. You know, the situation uh, was getting more difficult in, in, in Poland. Yeah. Anti-Semitic uh, propaganda was on the rise with real consequences, pogroms, yes. intimidation. So uh, that, that's how they, they, they found themselves in France. And, and my grandfather, Usher uh, Schwarzbart, uh, didn't speak a word of French. He was what they call a Luftmann, mm -hmm. uh, man of the wind. He was uh, born to study the Torah in a yeshiva somewhere and to have to provide for his family selling socks and little objects on, on French flea markets was basically the only thing uh, he could qualify for in that context. And uh, it was just eating him inside. Mm. And your father eventually left France. My father never left France. Ah. We, we, my mother and him, for uh, a year and a half, lived in, in Senegal. Uh -huh. Then went to live in Guadeloupe. Yes. And then eventually, yeah, we, we, we left France to go to Switzerland. But Switzerland is really an extension of France because it's the French-speaking part of uh, Switzerland. So it's like a French province. Yes. Although during the war, uh, the French territory was divided in, into the occupied part, you know, the Nazi occupied part and the, 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 what they call the liberated part of France. So he left Metz, where he was born, to join the resistance uh -huh. in, the, in, in the free France. And did he lose family in the war? Oh, yeah. He saw his, uh, both his parents climb on the train. So it's something that uh, stayed with him, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's your father's side. Now, meanwhile, on your mother's side. On my mother's side, we have this uh, society of, of the French Antilles where segregation was still operational, you know, uh, in, in, into the 19th century because in the 1860s that, that uh, uh, slavery was abolished there. The early French revolutionaries abolished slavery late 18th century, mm. I think it's uh, 1792, just to see it reestablished by N Napoleon in the early uh, 19th century, I think it was uh, 1802. So basically there was about 10 years oh. of freedom for the slaves, and then they learned that uh, they had to regain the plantation, mm. and, and th those who didn't were killed, of course, or tortured. This continued almost uh, uh, until the, the end of the, 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 the century. So, so it's one of the heaviest tragedies of, of uh, modern times. If you, if you think of, of history in terms of long cycles, that has left uh, a society that was uh, uh, still very much divided in terms of racial lines mm -hmm. uh, when I was growing up. Uh, thank God today things have evolved, evolved significantly, o although... You, you still have uh, all the plantation owners' families controlling much of uh, the mm -hmm. economy. But in actuality, politicians, doctors, lawyers, uh, and people who are creating uh, new waves of uh, activities uh, are from all walks of life and, and races today. Things are evolving, but when I was growing up, uh, it was still heavy. You know, it was very normal to say that uh, black people are ugly, dumb inferior and you, you you heard this from both whites and blacks hmm. and you spent much of your childhood in guadeloupe I, I, was, I spent the first 10 years of my life split between switzerland and guadeloupe and in, in since switzerland i was the only brown kid at school and since i was two years ahead in my curriculum i basically was a perfect target for all, all those uh, blonde hair blue eye bullies who were, were targeted me mercilessly. I mean, you were small, you were dark, you were Jewish, you were everything. And, and, I, and I was the head of my class in every, every <laughs> discipline, uh, so everybody hated me for it, <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, the, my, my, my childhood was not very fun, I have to uh, say. Both of your parents are writers. Yes. It's interesting because they come from such different backgrounds, and yet they 
both shared this thing, right? They both shared a love of the word. Exactly. My mother, though, discovered her talent for writing by presenting to my father an account of some things that she she lived through in her childhood, a scene of kids playing next to the river in Guadeloupe and uh, <laughs> challenging each other to the dozens. Because my, my father was writing a book about the, the French Antilles at the time as a follow-up to to the last of the just because uh, he he saw the Jewish history and the black history as part of one and the same evolution mm -hmm. or devolution in at some points of human tragedy so all the books he he wrote and all the books that my mother uh, has written as well are all part of this great saga of human tragedy uh, involving the world through the eyes of characters f either from Jewish or Afro-Caribbean descent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in the latest books, which, which my mother is still working on, you have this actually meeting, this, this, this meeting of uh, uh, characters from both sides. And one of the characters, of course, is a, Jew, a jazz musician who is uh, both Jewish and black, of yes. course. <laughs> yes. So all of this was very strong in you. What do you think if... If you had had to answer the question as a 18-year-old, you know, how do you feel? Do you feel like you're from Guadeloupe? Do you feel French? Do you feel connected to Switzerland? Do you feel connected to Africa? Do you feel Jewish? How, how do you think you felt then? You know, I knew early on in my life that uh, I cannot go down a regular path, that uh, it would be hard for other human beings to totally accept me the way I am. On one hand, it was hard, but on the other hand, it was an opportunity to weed out all the nonsense from either culture. I'm not talking only about uh, Caribbean or Jewish culture, but uh, you know, later on, uh, the French culture that I was exposed to by being in Paris and mm -hmm. uh, doing the School of Government and then uh, working at the French Senate, being immersed in the political ch culture of the time. And then later on, going to Berklee College of Music and seeing the black table and the white table, mm. you know, and, and basically being different gave me the freedom to always keep my sanity and, and not being tied to uh, some type of allegiance that robbed me of my sense of criticism. Of self-criticism. Or criticism of the, the environment that I was a part of. Mm -hmm. Awareness of it. Ability Awareness to see it, of, yeah. of uh, what's beautiful yes. and, and what's silly or what's uh, downright cruel and absurd. Yes. You just kind of laid out a trajectory that I think is unusual. You first pursued a career in politics. You went to Sciences Po. You were working in the Senate. You were drawn to a political career before you were drawn to a musical career. You know, being drawn is a world that I will not uh, endorse. I always wanted to do something creative, but uh, I was lied to. Everyone, <laughs> in order to basically secure my material future, dingled in front of me the myth according to which by being high up in the hierarchy of French administration, I would have the time and the leisure to do whatever I wanted to pursue, which was a blatant lie. I don't know if it was uh, intentional, you know, if it was based on actual awareness, uh, knowledge, or just something that they were repeating around me. But, you know, uh, I was a good student, so they pushed me to go to the top, and, and the top in French society is occupying the heights of French administration. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize how much responsibility was involved in it. And, and also how much you had to absorb this absurd culture of uh, being uh, subservient to the rules and being blind to the hypocrisy of pretending to fight for the, the good of the greater number, mm -hmm. fight for the greater good, and when in actuality you fight for your party, you yeah. fight for certain individuals that you, you are tied to and uh, you must uh, lie to represent their interests and also cover up whatever you see that your conscience is telling you clearly that it's not right. Mm -hmm. You know, so after a, a year, I was convinced that I had to change path. I was not seduced by the money, 
and the respect, quote unquote, I, I, I couldn't really give a, a rat's uh, behind about any of that, actually. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I absolutely did not want to become one of those people. I didn't see myself as one of those. I could never identify. I could clearly see through them, though. <laughs> Uh, because it, it was pretty simple, <laughs> you know, what, what they were all after. Were they interested in you because of your background? Were you a kind of unusual player in that, in that world? I was a great speech writer. Ah. So people from the left side of the party, you know, senators, even the, the, the ones that, that I didn't work for, would come to me mm -hmm. for, for speech writing. Mm -hmm. I, I could make a little ex a, a extra money, actually, Although I didn't need to, uh, I was making a great living yeah. just based on my speech writing uh, ability. Yes. At the time, my mind was already made up that I needed to do something, either write, mm -hmm. you know, or play music. The problem is that I had just started playing the saxophone. I understand you started playing at 24 years old. Yes. By the time I, I entered that line of work, I was 25. The line of work the, the, in the, the Senate the, or in music? Uh, Senate. Ah, so you had just started playing saxophone. Yeah. yeah. The, the prospects of making a living as a musician, as, especially as a saxophone player, was absolutely out of reach. It, it was uh, irrealistic and it was literally fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's fate that uh, put me in a particular situation. Uh, I was uh, uh, in, in Paris listening to a Garrison Fuel uh, that guitar player that, that uh, at the time was um, teaching at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the end of his set in, in, in uh, I think, Cabo de la Uche, one of those very small little holes in, in the entrails of uh, Paris. <laughs> I think there was me and somebody else that were, that, that were left uh, in the audience at, at the time. So he saw my, my, my horn case and he said, you know, do you want to play the last song? It must have been the blues or, you know, mm -hmm. one of those standards that everybody knows. I was so excited because, yeah. uh, you know, it, it was all so new to me. And at, at the end, he was like, so, uh, you know, uh, what have you been uh, putting out uh, in terms of CDs? Uh, when, when, is, when is your next tour? And I was like, <laughs> well, uh, you, you, you're so far from the truth. I, I just started playing, you know, and I'm self-taught. and I have no idea of any of what you you're talking about right now uh, and, 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 and uh, he told, told me about Berkeley which I had never heard of at the time I was so disconnected from uh, so what were you working on how did you learn how to play what did you listen to I was listening to Train Dexter Gordon uh, Miles Davis Wes Montgomery uh, and playing along and playing along yeah yeah just learning the, the standards and, and, and uh, trying to imitate the solos you know, I would say cr transcribe the solos and understand how they were constructed, you know, w w uh, how the, the, they, they were making the changes and the space between the, the phrases and how they were building it and uh, trying to understand the, 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 the different stages of history from swing to bebop to uh, uh, modal jazz, how to play more uh, open uh, or even out on car progressions that are more modal and, 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 and staying in, in basically around one tonal center mm -hmm. versus playing a southern chords like on giant steps. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I was trying to understand all this stuff. Uh, by yourself, pretty by much. By myself. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, I couldn't read music. Uh, I knew some chords from playing guitar, but uh, I didn't have any theory. But, you know... We all know that, that Sash Mo, for instance, couldn't read a, a note mm -hmm. of music and mm -hmm. look how he could hear harmony. So I was never faced by the fact that I, I didn't know theory. Yeah. Uh, I was like, you know, uh, I'm just going to enjoy learning it by ear. Yes. You know, and, and this is actually what I want. I, I remember buying a little uh, solfege uh, book. I was so bored after, uh, after five minutes, I was, you know, forget about it. Uh, I have no chance at ever becoming a professional musician, but on the other hand, I, I tremendously enjoy transcribing solos and understanding how they work and how to really phrase to beautifully uh, interpret a, a melody, that kind of stuff. So this is what I, w I was doing by myself in my little room when I was not writing speeches for senators. 
And what was the other musical diet that you had as a young man before you discovered jazz? So my first instrument was the guoka drums. Hey, what is that? It's a, a barrel, uh-huh. a wooden barrel covered with a goat skin that has very interesting resonance. It, it's like a djembe. It can be pretty loud and, and high, but it also has a beautiful bottom. So there is something very warm to that guoka drum that basically is unique to Guadeloupe. This is my very first exposure to actually playing music. I was very passionate about it by the time I, I was uh, four years old uh, up until I would say about eight. Playing the guoka drum. Playing the guoka drum. And, and then around six and eight, I played the guitar. And uh, I was into blues and jazz music. Mm -hmm. And And that reached you in Guadeloupe? That virus came to find me when I was in Switzerland. Uh Because my best friend and probably my my only friend at the time (laughs) was named uh, Moshe Neyman. Uh, He he was uh, originally from Israel. And his dad, a psychiatrist, had an amazing jazz record collection. Uh I don't know if you remember at the time, you're probably too young, but... We had little cassette tapes. Sure, of course. Uh, with, with my allowance, uh, I was buying uh, cassette tapes and, and then recording vinyl after vinyl, the entire collection. And uh, after a few months, my entire walls were covered fr- from top to bottom uh, with, with cassette tapes. There was no, uh, not an inch of space for anything else. Mm. And, and that, that was my entire world. Was listening to this music. Was listening to music, yes. yeah, and, 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 and jazz in particular. Yes. You know, there's so much in this part of your narrative that I think speaks to what it means to be a musician, you know. And what I see in you, your history is that by the time you put the saxophone in your mouth, you are deeply aware of personal narrative, of history, and I've just heard you say how much music you had listened to before you played, because it's kind of outrageous to think that you put a horn in your mouth at 24 years old and figure this thing out by yourself. And it's not so long after that that you start to really swim in the deep end of the pool and play with some pretty established musicians. You know, there was an instant connection with the horn. Yeah. I was uh, in Guadeloupe when I first tried uh, tenor saxophone at a friend's house she had all kinds of instruments, yeah. with, and she played none. <laughs> <laughs> I was deeply enamored with a train and, mm-hmm. and, and Dexter Gordon, and, and uh, when I saw that tenor saxophone, I was like, wow, you have a tenor saxophone you don't, don't play? Can, yeah. I, can I try it? Yeah. After 20, 25 minutes, I, I was playing melodies, and I, I figured where the scale were, you know. Uh, hmm. She was like, oh, you never told me you played the saxophone. <laughs> and, and, and we had a friend in the room that was like, Oh, that's awesome that you play the saxophone. We we have a gig that we <laughs> and we need a saxophone player tomorrow. I was like, uh, I just started twenty minutes ago, and they were like, oh man, stop your BS and, and you know, uh, are you available or not? So you played a gig on day two. So, so on day two, uh, and 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 uh, several times a, a week on, on during that summer. I was I, I was playing you know I was gigging <laughs> on the tenor saxophone, <laughs> playing little begins from 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 the Caribbeans yeah. Uh huh. So after this guy told you about Berkeley, so so he he sent me some manuals you know to to pass the tests yeah. Uh, reading in, air training arranging, my reading sucked when I, I auditioned, but I got some good ratings uh, uh, for improvisation and technique on my instrument. And sound? Did you have a sound uh, and, and already? There was a special mention about my sound. Yeah. They took me in, and then after a semester, they gave me a full scholarship to stay mm-hmm. uh, because I quickly started playing, actually, around town. That's how I eventually started playing with the heavyweights that were in Boston at the time, uh, Daniel Perez, uh, Bob Moses, Giovanni Hidalgo, mm-hmm. and though they were my, my three mentors. Mm-hmm. I stayed uh, the, the the whole... Scholarity in Berkeley, w- which was such a, a blessing. I was still an open canvas. I, I was able to build proper embouchure, proper technique, mm. uh, understand how to properly breathe, and uh, just practice eight hours a day for a number of years. What did your family think about this change? Nobody n- quite knew what to think of this. Some friends or, or family thought I, I had l- lost my mind. Yes. 
some said that uh, I had stolen money from the government. I was running away. Uh, I heard that some people thought that I was secretly gay mm-hmm. and uh, I ran away from uh, my family uh, in order to live my life as a gay man somewhere. All, all this was very creative, actually. <laughs> uh, I admire them for you know finding a rational... <laughs> the, right, the truth was much simpler, but much less rational. You were playing saxophone. Yeah, you know, who, who, who no, nobody could 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 <laughs> come to terms with the fact that I, I love something, and I just pr- decided to pursue it, although it, I was new and not very good at it, and I probably had no chance of ever accomplishing anything playing the saxophone. Uh, I had left a situation where I had a. a a limousine with a, a personal driver, some uh, a mansion and 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 uh, service staff, and I left all this to eat cornflakes and ramen, you know, uh, and and playing music in some obscure practice room uh, down in, in basements of uh, Berkeley College of Music. It just didn't add up to people. And almost ten years older than many of the kids who were enrolling in the school. Oh man, you know, all the good students at Berkeley were telling me. Seriously, you left this to do that, uh, or you left that to do this. You know that you have absolutely no chance of of, of ever doing anything uh, in, in, on, on that scene. The, the, all the kids who are coming in, they are killers uh, already when they enter Berkeley. You know, you competing against this, uh, you you just lost your, your mind. Go go back and and beg for your your mm. your old job. It's, it's funny because. Over the years, many of those the, the people who told me that uh, approached me for for a gig. Yeah, and the, none of them remember ever discouraged me in <laughs> such a heavy fashion. Uh, and I, I, of course, I will never remind them. But uh, I'm thinking to myself, somehow I really defied the odds. I didn't think of it in in such term. I was just following my my passion. But in hindsight, I had virtually no chance of ever ever doing anything that I've done (laughs) in the last 30 years. Yes. You mentioned before we move into some of that, you mentioned that, you know, you had these three mentors, Danilo Perez, Giovanni Hidalgo, and Bob Moses. Yes. All three extremely unique individuals. Oh, yeah. With very unique backgrounds themselves. Oh, yeah. And a kind of related path all three of them to doing what they do right i mean finding their own connection to uh an authentic culture and representing it within the music you know i learned so much from all three from bob moses i learned most of all the importance of melody Hmm. he constantly told me you know you don't even need half of the technique that you have to make great music. You should just stop practicing technique for at least a month and just uh, lock yourself in and play ballads all day, (laughs) nothing else. And uh, listen to strictly singers sing ballads, singing ballads. It stayed with me and I I have a very vocal approach to playing the saxophone. Mm -hmm. And from from Giovanni Hidalgo, I, I realized how much... I was deeply connected to Afro-Caribbean uh, rhythms because uh, in so many situations during my life, I was thrown in bands where non-natives understood nothing. You know, uh, like a, a few American players uh, came and, and, and everybody had to show them, oh, this is where the one is and the clave starts here. And so, uh, I'm, I'm, Although I, I, I couldn't count the clave or anything, I knew where it was. Mm-hmm from having myself an Afro-Caribbean background and being immersed in, in rhythms mm-hmm. uh, since I was a child, mm-hmm. I realized how much of an asset it was. You know, it gave me a connection with the playing with, with drummers, you know. That's why I play duets with uh, all the great drummers that, that, that I encounter in, 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 on my path, like Ari Honig. Mm-hmm. That language is natural to me, mm-hmm. you know, talking to, to, to drummers. Well, that's why I think it's interesting that what Bob Moses showed you was the importance of melody, that you have a drummer who teaches you the importance of melody. It's a very interesting lesson to learn from a drummer. He's a drummer, but he's a composer. Yes. He's not known for his composing. Unfortunately, but he has, he's constantly writing and thinking of the most gorgeous melodies. Mm-hmm. He's never impressed by uh, drummers with chops. He couldn't care less, mm-hmm. but he's going to shed tears <laughs> over a beautiful melody. Yes. 
and uh, Danilo is the one who made me understand how I could tie all my worlds together. Yes. Although I knew I had to follow a different formula than him, of course. Yes. I needed to find what's absolutely unique in what I carried inside of me, which is a serious research in itself. Yes. But yet uh, I understood huh. through his music how it was possible. Yes, and shortly after you were there with him, he started a series of records like Panamunk and those albums where yeah. he explored that bridge, right? Oh, totally. Panamunk was crucial yeah. in my development. Yes. You know, at, at the time I had already started the... Uh, writing my first Gwoka jazz compositions, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I was doing in, in uh, Phil Wilson's uh, ensemble. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time I brought a composition to, uh, to Phil, he told me, you know, this is something that uh, uh, you need to pursue because only you can write that stuff. Yes. There is no Guadalupean jazz musician in America that has your level of understanding of jazz mm -hmm. and your level of understanding of uh, Gwoka music yes. and can bridge the two together, th this is something that you have to do. That really planted the seed that, that developed over uh, two decades before it turned into a record, but uh, it never left me. So all of this, the seeds are planted here for what more recently arrived and blossomed, but in the meantime, it seems like at, at some time, you came into contact with essentially what we now call Neo Soul. You got involved in a crew of players and records, and that's the stuff that most people saw you on before they discovered all of this roots exploration. Yes. Uh, you know, I first joined uh, Chris Soul, this uh, Cuban, uh, Afro Cuban project by Roy Hargrove. Yeah. When uh, Roy transitioned to other projects, at some point he, he started working with D'Angelo. Mm -hmm. And D'Angelo needed. Uh, a horn section for some uh, festivals that he had, I think in 97, something like that. And so uh, Roy was always happy about our interaction in, in, in inside of Crystal. So he called me as, as part of that, that horn section. Then we parted ways and I was like, you know, this is a chapter of my life, both Roy and D'Angelo and all that, that, that's probably behind. Uh, and I, I, I put to the uh, other things. And then out of the blue, one day I, I receive a call from D'Angelo and he says, so Brother Jacques, uh, I have a tour for my album Voodoo and I tried uh, five or six uh, horn sections and I'm not really satisfied. Uh, I remember we had a good connection and everything. Do you, do you, do you wanna just stop by the studio? So I, I showed up and I, I saw two or three other horn players coming out of the, the <laughs> door. So obviously he, he was still like trying all kinds of dif different people. And uh, I played three phrases uh, just to warm up. But, you know, I, I, I don't warm up with long tones. I play some crazy stuff. Uh, and, and he started laughing. And as right away he was like, man, I, I trust you to put together the, the horn section. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, I don't know what I did for that, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, you he, put he, the, you warmed up and you got the gig. Yeah, you know, he heard the 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 intensity in, in yeah. my tone. So uh, wh whatever <laughs> it was, you know, I came in with the big afro that I had back uh -huh. in the day, and basically the whole vibe felt right to him. You were brought in originally through Roy Hargrove because you were working on a more Afro Caribbean project with mm. Roy first. Yeah, were you interested in the kind of music that D'Angelo was making and that Roy was working on with D'Angelo? Were you listening to that kind of music? No. But uh, I've always been interested in groove music. Yeah. You know, groove music with content, with, with character and depth. Yeah. So when uh, Roy played me a couple of tracks, and I was like, wow, this, this, this really look, you know, this really sounds interesting to yeah. me. I was still, you know, a little on the fence, but I was like, you know, I'll come and, and, and uh, let, let's see, yeah. let, let's see how, how it goes. And, and the second I heard, uh, Questlove and Pino and, and James Poyser hooking the, the, the grooves together and, and how some parts of the beat were, uh, were a little slower, others were a little rushed on purpose, and it created this absolutely unique rhythmic vibe. I was like, wow, this is serious. You know, th this is just not pop music. It is uh, a high level of artistic expression. Uh, I respected the... 
the music right away and it made sense to me it appealed to me yeah. as something really original yes i really call uh, this whole n rhythmic conception that was brought in by jay diller and and uh, some some of uh, the the neo soul uh, artists as as a new revolution yeah in rhythmic conception and phrasing in bridging traditional soul music with uh, the sophistication of jazz. Well, maybe in that way it was not so foreign to you because you had been thinking about how to build these kinds of bridges in your own world, right? Like how to build... Totally. Uh, but the difference what was that that music was really rooted in gospel as well. Gospel was the, 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 the differentiating factor. Yeah. And I, I had not been exposed directly, at least, to gospel music. Mm -hmm. I, I was always a fan Actually, from my childhood, I had several gospel uh, records, yes. which I absolutely adored, huh. and that moved me to tears. You know, that, that I, I was always absolutely enthralled by uh, gospel music, but nevertheless, I had not had yes. uh, the opportunity yes. to, to, to be part of a gospel project. Yes. And I, I totally heard how gospel in the middle of the elements that I, I described uh, what was the element that totally changed all this and I tried to uh, absorb it, soak it in and put some of it in, into my music. Yes. And meanwhile, because that whole universe that you describe around Questlove and Pino and mm. uh, Roy Hargrove and the RH Factor also, which was a kind of an outgrowth of that, was very innovative. And we look at that today as being foundational to a kind of music. You heard it before we did, this rhythmic push and pull that they were developing that has completely influenced generations well, of drummers and rhythm totally section players. It has totally changed the, the way people hear grooves yeah. and think of grooves today. But you were playing it early on it was the first wave of it when you were it, doing it, it. it uh, i was part of the, uh, the people who who helped develop it yes i was part of the the foundational journey yes i, I feel that I, i've been blessed to understand what it is to wade through uh, uncharted uh, waters to find a sound to find a concept uh, yes that served me well later because creating Guoka jazz was a challenge. There had been attempts to, to, to mix the two, but in my opinion, kind of pedestrian fashion, mm -hmm. like taking a regular standard progression and just playing them over Guoka ch changes, which in my view had little to no interest. You know, it, it, this is not what I call creating a concept. So what did you do? How did you define the terms around your version of Guoka jazz or the Guoka jazz that you developed? So from the uh, rhythmic point of view, for instance, I assigned a rhythmic role to each instrument in the rhythm section, especially. Instead of uh, having bass lines that mimicked and reproduced rhythmic patterns from the drums, I found bass lines that interacted with the, the rhythms from the drums. Hmm. And then I found keyboard uh, or guitar patterns of, of comping that uh, were a counterpoint to those bass lines. So this really was like developing like what, the equivalent of what Montuna would be mm -hmm. in the Cuban music or developing actual kind of language mm -hmm. that has to be spoken in order for this music to, to work. Totally, and, and, and then I looked both at song structures and uh, the type of uh, harmony that uh, diverge from uh, jazz standards to create a, a, a more modern sound uh -huh. that oscillated between impressionist harmony and modal harmony. So it's a combination of those two. Today, are there other people playing Guoka jazz according to the values that you sort of assign to the music? Yeah, uh, uh, there is one uh, right now at, at, in the French Quarter Festival. Uh, Arnaud Dolman, who, who's been playing my music actually for for the past 15 years hmm. uh and and now ha has created his own yes although he has totally you know his voice i can hear how and he says it actually yeah. you know it's, it's not something that i i'm, I'm making up he says how, how much my music was foundational mm -hmm. to the work that he's doing today mm -hmm. there are a bunch of uh young Caribbean musicians who either have uh, directly 
found inspiration in what I did or drew the energy to create their own based on either their Trinidadian uh, or, mm-hmm. or Jamaican or Haitian culture. And talk about Haitian uh, um, through through jazz, uh, Racine Haiti. Yes. I also created this voodoo jazz equation. Tell me about that. So Haitian voodoo melodies have rhythms and structures and modulations and intervals that are very specific to that style. Uh-huh. You, you will not find them in African voodoo music. Mm-hmm. You will not find them in Cuban mm-hmm. uh, Santeria, which mm-hmm. is another style of voodoo music. And you will not find them in Brazilian uh, mm-hmm. uh, Condomble, which is another style of voodoo music. Mm-hmm. So in order to use this and turn it into jazz, you have to really know that music. Mm-hmm. First of all, you need to have the love for it. Yes. Because uh, there is a lot of aspects to it. There are over hmm. 10,000 voodoo songs, hmm. you know. Not that I know that as, as many as 10,000, but... Uh, uh, how, two, did you, how did you find them? How did you learn because, them? Uh, from my mother. Basically, I was born into it. That's the, the, the music that my mother uh, listened to every day. Voodoo music. Voodoo music. But it's really kind of Haitian voodoo Haitian music. Haitian voodoo music. And was that connected to her spiritual religious identity? Not her native uh, identity, but, but uh, th- this is something that she adopted later on upon meeting with several Haitian young people that she met in France and in Switzerland la- later on. When you were a boy? Before I was born. Uh-huh. So when you were born, she had adopted this voodoo spirituality yes. into her life and it came with the music and some of the traditions. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and it was really important to her. I did not know how, but I knew that this would be important to me too. It's one of the many gifts that I received from this multicultural background. Yes. I mentioned earlier being able to feel comfortable in many rhythmic situations. This is uh, one of the reasons why as well, because... You know, there is a, a rhythmic construction to the melodies of voodoo music, which, uh, as you might know or not, is really the culture that gave birth to, to, to jazz music. Yes. The first jazz musicians came from this, this uh, voodoo creole culture yes. and brought that knowledge yes. of how to build melodies and modulations and int- intervals and from their voodoo background. Mm-hmm. They added uh, harmony from the, the, the knowledge and the technique of piano, but uh, the content really is rooted in, in Haitian voodoo music. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, that's a, uh, not an easier fusion, but it has mm-hmm. some roots already in jazz that have been explored already, as opposed to the guoka music, where you really had to kind of find it on your own. As you say, there's a long tradition of voodoo that has been kind of westernized or Americanized or modernized. That is true. Although the path, I had to see it. Yes. Somebody had to identify it. Yes. Nobody pointed it out to me. Because then again, what was uh, called uh, voodoo jazz, if, if, if it's even a thing, uh, I'm not even sure before, what was just taking a, a few jazz standard harmonies over voodoo rhythms, Yeah. which to me has nothing to do with a creation. Yes. You know, uh, and, and is, is, is absolutely not paying justice to the melodic side of voodoo, which is for me as important, if not more important. Than the rhythmics aspect. Than the rhythmic as- aspect. For me, you can take a voodoo chant uh, with no accompaniment, and it will absolutely 100% stand on its own as a compelling art work. Uh, the chant, the, the, the melody. Chant, just, just the melody. So this is interesting, man, because as I've been thinking about your trajectory, right? I mean, the most recent thing that you have done is now to take all of this experience that you have in applying your musical point of view, your values, your aesthetic, your artistry to uh, the music of Guadeloupe and Haitian voodoo music, and finally now close the circle and make a record of arrangements of Jewish music. But the same can in many ways be true of these old liturgical melodies, that the Jewish melodies are intrinsically Jewish without anything else. They stand on their own. Absolutely. As these ancient melodies. Absolutely. And it's just a bucket for you to fill with the rest of, you know, you could fill the rest of it up with yourself. And the same mental operation was there for me. I, I, nobody showed me the way. I tried to find how to compose and express myself as a composer 
through those melodies. Mm-hmm. Through your arrangements of the melodies, your interpretation of exactly. the Exactly. Uh, so much so uh, that as, as we w- were mentioning uh, earlier, yeah. people who don't know Jewish chants, yeah. they're, they're like, well, what, what is Jewish about this? Yeah. Are those all your compositions? Uh, is there a, even like a little bit of Jewish yeah. uh, melodies in, in, in those? I played recently in the birthplace of my father in Metz. Mm-hmm. I was invited there by a cultural committee because they, they, they were celebrating my, my father's uh, memory and um, my father's work. And, and, and uh, the members of that com- committee, they're not Jewish, but they had invited a lot of people from the Jewish community mm-hmm. to come. And, and, and uh, during the, the um, uh, sound check, the guy came to me horrified and, and, and excited at the same time. And he said, wow, this is so intense. This is so vibrant, but... You know, there is a, there are a lot of Jewish people coming tonight. I was expecting a Jewish project, and <laughs> I, I was like, "Don't worry," <laughs> you know. And sure enough, you had people singing along. Yes, you know, uh, the, the, even though, uh, for instance, Ose, Ose Shalom is is in five, then in seven, yeah. and they, they probably didn't know why it, you know, it felt a little weird to them, but they were singing along. All the songs, uh, Mao Su, uh, the, yes. and the guy from from the, the cultural committee was like, "How do they know?" It's like, "Do, do, do they know your compositions?" And I'm like, "No, those are Jewish chants, yes. man." You know. And did you grow up hearing those chants? Did you have to rediscover them later, or how did you? So most of them I, I've heard as a child. Yeah. Especially when when we lived in uh, Switzerland. Yeah. There was a beautiful Jewish community there, and during the holidays, the Jewish holidays. Mm-hmm. We would partake in in uh, mm-hmm. synagogue services, uh, and uh, we 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 would be invited, you know, at at, uh, at some of my parents' friends' mm-hmm. house and just celebrated. Yes. So just uh, the same as uh, I received uh, other musical influences, I received this as both a musical and a philosophical defining yes. influence. Why do you think this took longer to come to than the other the other projects? Because uh, Afro Caribbean music is foundational in jazz. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Therefore, it, it is more natural to connect the two. Mm-hmm. Now, to somehow infuse a different life into those Jewish chants, mm-hmm. coming from a jazz and an Afro Caribbean perspective. Is, uh, is, is a totally different mental process. Mm-hmm. And it's something that uh, I had to want, I had to pursue as a goal, which I have for a number of years now. And it comes from a, a resolve that I had when my father passed to give him a, a proper send-off. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to leave silence behind me. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I didn't want to uh, create another Klezmer project. <laughs> For me, the most powerful part of music is always spiritual. Mm-hmm. I remember how I felt listening to Manishtana, how I felt li- listening to Mao Tzu, mm-hmm. uh, such powerful melodies and carrying such lights, uh, such message also mm-hmm. of uh, being open-minded, open-hearted, you know, just open to the world. Uh, and to uh, to other people's uh, suffering as well. Yes, it, it was important for me to go from to, uh, to start from that spiritual yes. platform rather than than you know just uh, sounding vaguely Middle Eastern through <laughs> through another Klezmer project. You know? Yes, it's interesting also hearing the way you approached Woka jazz, for example, was what can I do to create a language that other people will eventually speak. Not only me, but other people can take this music that I'm starting to develop and they can then run with it and, and develop it. Whereas when it comes to taking Jewish melody, it seems like it's a much more personal expression. You're doing it for personal reasons. It's spiritual, but it's also it's an honoring of your father and it's what is your way of playing these songs. It is a little selfish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, 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 <laughs> I, would, I would call my whole process as being a little selfish. I, I just wanted to celebrate my father's memory, yeah. you know, and, and uh, honestly didn't expect anything to come out of it. Yeah. Because uh, uh, early on in the process, as a matter of fact, uh, 
I, I, I played it to uh, either some of my friends, you know, we, we mentioned that, yeah. or uh, my ex-manager, David Pasek, you know, he, he didn't even gratify <laughs> uh, my, my message with a response. He, he, mm. uh, I think he wrote me back, uh, dot, 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 dot. You know, it's like, what the heck are you doing? You know, you're wasting your time with, with this. Basically, go back to, to doing something that's already palatable to a great number of people, uh, uh, like Glasper or some, you know, some other musicians that uh, hmm. managed to connect to uh, the young generation. Uh, it's funny, man. The, the second you say Jewish, it's like there's, and it's just built in. There's these little warning lights that go off in the business, like don't do it, don't do it. And and and, and funny enough, that uh, ex manager of mine is Jewish. Yes, I'm sure. And, <laughs> I'm sure he and, is. And very much attached to his Jewish culture. Yes. His son is bar mitzvah and everything. Basically, every week I get another article uh, yes. about uh, Hazan now. Yes. Uh, and and uh, uh, <laughs> my, my booking agent is calling me about a new gig. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. I really did not expect anything to come out of this very selfish yes. <laughs> project. Uh, uh, but, you know, it is genuine. Yes. It, it comes from the heart. It represents uh, really, uh, when, when I think of it, uh, all the things that I am. I'm fully committed to a jazz expression that's rooted in Afro-Caribbean music, and I'm fully committed to claiming my, my Jewish identity. Yes. You spoke about it earlier, and we learn about it and, th and talk about it often, about the uh, relationship between black culture and Jewish culture and the development of American popular culture. And yet there are very few people who in a single body embody that experience you know so for you to have explored all of these tentacles i think is a very compelling thing to witness you know because it's your personal development but i think that it's easy to project something onto it from the outside also to, as you discover it that's my feeling watching hearing you tell this story you know as i, I trace my path step by step project by project now I see a direction. <laughs> I couldn't tell which way it was up when I started. Mm -hmm. I, I just knew I wanted to do something that w was authentically me yeah. and that nobody else could do. Yeah. And that I, I personally believed in, I even though I might be the, the only one on planet Earth, you know? Uh, and uh, now, after nine CDs behind me, I can see how I have become a builder of bridge yes. between people, between traditions, and even between races. Yes. What do you tell your students? To never negate any part of who they are. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we have such a pressure to belong uh, that uh, doing anything different becomes more and more frightening. And building the courage to first of all see who you are, but who you are, mm -hmm. not who other people tell you that you are, mm. your parents or your professors or your other fellow musicians, but who you see in yourself mm -hmm. takes a, a lot more strength today, I feel. There is a pressure to conform. I let them know that's a the artist is first and foremost someone who has the guts to be himself. When they come to me with, uh, with ideas, I try to encourage them both in the, the usual musical way, uh, telling them that this chord could be different mm -hmm. or uh, there should be a, an interlude here yeah. or there, there is a coda missing. Uh, but also who that represents. You know, what, 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 what's the message behind your music? Yes. You know, is there a concept? Or is this uh, just a, a collection of compositions uh, inspired by different things that you've heard and that have nothing to do with one another? Mm -hmm. You know, and if it's the case, could you see yourself writing something that, that, that is more coherent with who you are? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'll try to to make them think beyond the little things. 
you know, uh, so that maybe when they're my age, they can see a direction as yes, well. <laughs> they can turn around behind them and see that it was going somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Well, Jacques schwartz Bart, thank you for going somewhere with me today and for building this bridge with me today. Thank you, Leon. There he was, the great Jacques schwartz Bart, Brother Jacques. I really enjoyed it. I, I learn a lot every time, and this was no exception. Ben, we'll see you soon. See you soon. Thanks, Leon.